law, therefore, you relinquish power, trust others. The more powerful you become, but in such a way that instead of having to lie awake nights controlling it, you do it beautifully by trusting the job to everyone else. And they carry it on. So you can go to sleep at night, and trust your nervous system to wake you up in the morning. You can even tell it, I want to wake up at six o'clock, and it'll wake you up just like an alarm clock. This seems a sort of paradox to say this, but the principle of unity, of coming to a sense of, of oneness with the whole of the rest of the universe, is not to try to be, obtain power over the rest of the universe. That will only disturb it and uh, antagonize it and make it seem less one with you than ever. The way to become one with the universe is to trust it as another, as you would, another, and say, let's see what you're going to do. But in doing that, you see, in saying that to everything else that you have been taught to think is not you, you are also saying it to yourself. Because finally, as I pointed out, you do not know where your decisions They pop up like hiccups. And when you make a decision, people have a great deal of anxiety about making decisions. There's this guy who, a uh, farmer, who ordered a help man to come in and uh, found he was an extraordinarily efficient worker. For the first day, he put him on sawing logs. And he sawed more logs than anybody had ever sawed. It was fantastic. But they were all done in one day. So the next day, he put him on to mending fences. And there were all kinds of broken fences on the farm. In one day, he had the whole thing done. What am I going to do with this guy? So he took him down into a basement and said, Look, here are all, our, uh, all the potatoes that are coming from this harvest. And I want you to sort them into three groups. Those that we sell, those that we use for seeding, and those that we throw away. So he left him that. At the end of the day, the laborer came back and said, Well, that's enough, mister. I quit. Well, he said, You can't quit. I've never had such an excellent weather. I'll raise your salary. I'll do anything. Keep you around me. Ah, I said, No. It's all right, mending fences and chopping wood, but this potato business is decision after decision after decision after decision. <laughs> <coughs> so when we decide, we're always worrying, did I think this over long enough? Did I take enough data into consideration? And if you think it through, you find you never could take enough data into consideration. The data for a decision in any given situation is infinite. So what you do is, you go through the motions of thinking out what you will do about this. And then when the time comes to act, you make a snap judgment. <laughs> I mean, I'm speaking a little extremely, uh, making some fun of it and uh, so on, because after all, uh, we, we do occasionally get the vague outlines of things and make the right decision on rational grounds. But we fortunately forget the variables that could have interfered with this coming out right. It's amazing how often it works. But warriors are people who think of all the variables beyond their control and what might happen. So then when you make a decision, and it works out all right, I think very little of it has much to do with
but somehow or other, you are able to decide and control things more harmoniously if you delegate authority by very great businessmen are those who can delegate authority, trust others to work for them, because those are people developing businesses on the same basic structure that is fundamental to a living organism. Delegation of authority. It loves and nourishes all things but does not lord it over them. You see that then what is happening is this. The more you let go of it, trust it. as if it were quite other than you. The more you realize the inseparable identity of self and other. Go back. If you try to find the identity of self and other by subjecting other to self, no go. If on the other hand you, you find it through giving self, that is control, over to other, trusting, you may make a mistake, you may make a bad gamble. But in the long run, you're acting on a principle which has the backing of evil. This is the way biological constant delegation. That's why, obviously, the democracy is superior to the monarchy. Tocqueville has said that democracy is always right, but for the wrong reasons. Because there is operating in a democracy the principle that Buckminster Fuller calls synergy. Synergy is the intelligence of a highly complex system, the nature of which is always unknown to the individual members. Because that goes back again to this point, that we're always entering a new environment. We don't ever know fully what the new environment is, because the only environments we know are the past ones. There is always then operating in uh, the development of cellular life on any level, a new way of organization, higher than any existing form. And we are not aware of it until after it's happened. If you ever saw, for example, the film Conti, uh, this man figured out a few things as to how to make a balsa wood raft sail from South America to the Pacific Island. But once he had set this in motion, he discovered that all sorts of unexpected factors cooperated with him. That when the wood got wet, it expanded so that the tides bit into it and held it completely secure. He never expected that. And he found that as he sailed along, flying fish would simply alight flat on the deck every morning for breakfast. That all kinds of natural factors, it was just, he, he, he touched a key where he was flowing with the course of nature and everything cooperated. Because he had touched the key, he made the act of faith. And he was just picking up, in other words, a practice which had been uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago had been followed by others who had worked it out by their great ecological awareness. So we do come out of this uh, way of thinking to something which has, I, I would say, the most enormously creative and revolutionary social consequences.
that it has become not virtuous, not self-sacrificing, not anything like that. It has become the hardest practical politics to let go control to others, give up trying to dominate the system. Also, in a parallel way, it has become at this time in our history very much hard practical politics. To learn how to enjoy ourselves. You can go to the Protestant people with their Protestant ethic who are against this kind of thing. Now say to them with great plea, it is your sovereign. Why? Because in an age of leisure, people have really got to know how to enjoy themselves. Because if they don't, they'll smash the whole future of the human race. So uh, a utopia has become uh, not some sort of a dream, but an urgent necessity. We can't do without it. Because if we try to do without it, what's going to happen is that we are going to terminate our race in mutual massacres. And so the present paranoia in the United States that is going on, where everybody is thinking about the new scapegoat, how great it will be to democracy, to get them out of power. For all this kind of victory, right and left politics has become irrelevant because we now have the opportunity of uh, trusting our own intelligence, our own technology. To take the risk of doing what we want which will work to the extent that we realize that what I want, basically, what I really want is what you want. And I don't know what you want. Surprise me. But that's my, that's the kinship between I and thou. So when I ask, I go right down to the question, which we start with, what do I want? The answer is, I don't know. When Bodhidharma was asked, who are you? Which is another form of the same question. He said, I don't know. Planting flowers to which the butterflies come. Bodhidharma says, I know. When you don't know what you want, you really reach the state of desire. really don't know. You see, there's a, there's a beginning stage of not knowing and there's an ending stage of not knowing. In the beginning stage, you don't know what you want because you haven't thought about it, or you've only thought superficially. Then when you, somebody forces you to think about it and go through it and say, yeah, I think I like this, I think I like that, I think I like the other, there's the middle stage. Then you get beyond that. Say, is that what I really want? In the end you say, no, I don't think that's it. I might be satisfied with it for a while, and I wouldn't turn my nose up at it. But it's not really what I want. Why don't you really know what you want? Two reasons that you don't really know what you want. Number one, you have it. Number two, you don't know yourself, because you never can. The Godhead is never an object of its own knowledge. 
Just as a knife doesn't cut itself, fire doesn't burn itself, light doesn't illumine itself. It's always an endless mystery to itself. I don't know. And this I don't know, uttered in the infinite interior of the spirit. This I don't know is the same thing as I love, I let go, I don't try to force or control. It's the same thing as humility. And so the Upanishad says, if you think that you understand from it, you do not understand. You have yet to be instructed further. If you know that you do not understand, then you truly understand. For the Brahman is unknown to those who know it, unknown to those who know it. And the principle is that any time you, as it were, voluntarily let up control, in other words, cease to cling to yourself, you have an access to power. Because you're wasting energy all the time in self-defense, trying to manage things, trying to force things. The moment you stop doing that, that wasted energy is available. Therefore, you are, in that sense, having that energy available, you are one with the divine principle. You have the energy. When you're trying, however, to act as if you were God, that is to say, you don't trust anybody and you're the dictator and you have to keep everybody in line, you lose the divine energy. Because what you're doing is simply defending yourself. So then, the principle is, the more you give it away, the more it comes back. Now you say, I don't have the courage to give it away. I'm afraid. You can only overcome that by realizing. You better give it away, because there's no way of holding on. The meaning of the fact, you see, that everything is dissolving from that we're all falling apart, we're all in a process of constant death, and that uh, the world they hope men set their hearts upon turn to ashes for its possible as it like snow upon the desert stuff and make it right into an hour and our time is down. You know, the cloud cap towers, the gorgeous palaces, the great road itself, I all which is inherited and dissolved, like this insubstantial magic thing that's been on the back. All falling apart. Everything. That's the, the great resistance to it. See, that, that fact that everything is in decay is your help. That is allowing you that you don't have to let go. Because there's nothing to hold on. <laughs> it's achieved for you, in other words, by the process of nature. So once you see that uh, you just don't have a prayer, it's all washed up, and that you will vanish and leave not a rack behind, really get with that, suddenly you find you have the power. It's enormous access of energy. But it's not the power that came to you because you grabbed it. It came in entirely the opposite way. The power that comes to you in that opposite way is power with which you can be trusted. Of course, what we've been talking about is not so much a set of ideas as an experience, or shall we say, experiencing. And uh, this kind of seminar, in comparison with uh, encounter groups or workshops of various kinds, or experiments in sensory awareness, is now being called a conceptual seminar. Although, I'm not talking about concepts. But the crucial question arises that a 
an understanding, a real feeling understanding of the polar relationship between the individual and the world is something that operates, uh, as we say, in your bones and isn't just a view that you hold or a belief that you hold. It's so curious that the emphasis of the Western tradition in religion is primarily upon right belief. Do you believe in the right dogmas, the right doctrines? And only secondarily upon right action. Because what you believe is in Christianity at any rate far more important than what you do because one is saved through faith not by works and early in its history the Christian church re rejected the movement in the church which had been known as Gnosticism from the Greek Gnosis which means knowledge and in a way there were some sound reasons for doing so because the Gnostics were what I would call anti-materialists. They divided human beings into three classes that were called, respectively, pneumatic, psychic, and hylic. The last one being H-Y-L-I-C, from the Greek, highly, or they would call it now, Ile, Ili, meaning wood. So the people were spiritual, psychological, and wooden. And uh, that is to say, the wooden people were those most absorbed in materiality and most closely identified with their bodies. And Orthodox Christianity re rejected this sort of distinction because of the perfectly correct idea that material existence is not inconsistent with spirituality. This is something which most Christians have forgotten. But they do believe as the central principle of Christianity in what's called the Incarnation that in uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Almighty God did in fact become material, become human. And by this process, initiated a transformation of the cosmos. In the words of Saint Athanasius, God became man, that man might become God. And you don't hear that from the pulpit very often. The Christian Church therefore emphasized pistis or faith as against gnosis or knowledge. Because they said you can never know God. God could never become an object of knowledge. And in this funny roundabout way, the Christian theologians were saying exactly the same thing as the Hindus. Only the Hindus do call this knowledge of God through faith. They call it Jnana, which is the same as the Greek word Gnosis. But just to give you a little sidelight on how words get mixed up in their meanings, we now have a class of person called an agnostic. And uh, an agnostic generally means a person who doesn't commit himself to any beliefs about the ultimate nature of things. He just says he doesn't know. But the original word, agnosia in Greek, meant a special kind of knowledge. It was called the dark knowledge of God. The knowledge of God in the cloud of unknowing to use the title of a mystical treatise written by an anonymous 14th century English monk. This monk derived his ideas 
from a very mysterious figure who wrote under the name of Dionysus the Areopagite. Dionysius was a 5th or 6th century Syrian monk who had learned his mysticism from Porphyry, who got it from Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonist, and who probably got uh, a great deal of stimulation from the intellectual world of Alexandria. And Alexandria in the early years of the Christian era was a tremendous exchange place between East and West. Buddhist monks visited Alexandria. It was uh, one of the great centers of trade between Rome and India. And as you may know, all Rome's gold eventually went to India for the purchase of pepper. And uh, as a result of this, the Roman economy collapsed. They bought too much luxury from India. India, in exchange, got Roman architecture. And uh, you'll see a lot of Roman architecture in Indian temples. But Alexandria was the great center for the Gnostics and for Christian theology. And some of the greatest theologians, Clement, Origen, Athanasius, St. Cyril, all worked out of Alexandria. And now going back to this strange monk, Dionysius. It was he who first put around the idea in Christian circles that there was such a thing of the knowledge as the knowledge of God by faith. By agnosia, really, by unknowing. And he, in a book which he wrote, a very short book called The Theologia Mystica, he wrote a treatise on the higher knowledge of God, which might be quoted directly from the Upanishads in certain parts of it. The last section of it reads like the Mandukya Upanishad, because it's a series of negations. It says what God is not. And he goes very far because he says that God is not one. He says our idea of unity falls far short of what God is. So does our idea of Trinity. So does our idea of spirit, our idea of mind, of justice, of love. All these things are not really God. And he says in another place, if anybody having seen God understood what he had seen, what he would have seen would not have been God, but some creature of God, less than God, some sort of angel or something like that. It's perfectly amazing to consider the influence that this man had. For writing under the name of Dionysus the Areopagite, he became identified, you see, with St. Paul's first convert in Athens. And legend has it that he was the first bishop of Athens and was martyred in Gaul. Now, well, he's known as St. Dennis. But St. Thomas Aquinas looked upon the writings of Dionysus the Areopagite as having the highest authority. And you could, if all the texts of Dionysus's work had been lost, you could restore most of it from quotations in St. Thomas. He wrote really two very important books. One was the one I said, the Theologia Mystica. The other was called The Divine Names. These two books presented the two phases of his theology. The book called The Divine Names was a discussion on the nature of God in terms of what God is like, by analogy. And this kind of knowledge of God he called cataphatic. From the Greek phemi, to speak or say, kata, meaning uh, to say according to, that is to say to speak by analogy. Where he used, though, entirely negative language about God, this sort of discourse was called apophatic. And the word apo meaning away from, to talk away from. Just as a sculptor, when he makes an image, 
reveals the image by removing stone. And so Dionysus explained that one attains the knowledge of God by discarding concepts. Which is exactly what the Hindus mean when they say, uh, of God one can only say, neti, neti, not this, not this, not any conception. Thus in Hindu philosophy, the highest state of consciousness in samadhi is called nirvikalpa samadhi, which means literally non-conceptual. Vikalpa means a concept, nir is a negation. So the non-conceptual knowledge. Now, people have greatly misunderstood this. They have imagined that unknowing the state of the highest contemplation was the acquisition of a blank mind, from which you first discarded thought, you went on to discard perception, you went on to discard any kind of sensory content in awareness until you were, so far as anyone could say, aware of nothing. And they supposed that this kind of cataconic state was mystical consciousness. This is often believed in India. If you go to the Vedanta Society and ask what do you mean by Nirvikalpa Samadhi, they will tell you that the one in that state has no consciousness whatsoever of the sensory world. That he is completely absorbed, as you sometimes see Hindu holy men sitting in a state where they are blind and deaf to everything going on around them. The founder of Chinese Zen, known as Huaynan, Describe people like that as no better than pieces of rock and lumps of wood. He said it's a very serious mistake indeed to confuse sunyata, the Sanskrit word for the great void, which is both the ultimate reality and the consciousness thereof. It is a great mistake to confuse it with nothingness. It is rather to be thought of as space or like space. Because space is not empty, it contains the whole universe. And so in the same way, the state of mind of a person who is truly enlightened is not empty. It contains everything. But like space, it is not stained by what it contains. And it's often said in Zen imagery, you can't hammer a nail into space. You can't spit on the sky and soil it. If you try, the spit will just return and hit your own face. So they go on to say the consciousness in all of us, your basic mind is like space. It is completely pure. But of course by purity, they don't mean unsexual which is, of course, what purity generally means in the Western world. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A person who is pure in heart is generally understood as one who never has any naughty thoughts. <laughs> you know what naughty means? It means vain, negative, empty. A naughty person, therefore, is one who doesn't amount to anything. It's just nothing. That's the real meaning. But uh, this misunderstanding of the nature of contemplation existed not only in India, from which it was transmitted to China, but also in the West. You read many treatises on Western mysticism, and there's still the feeling that getting into a deep, deep trance sometimes called rapture. Again, the word rapture has undergone some transformation. We talk about rapture as people being beside themselves with pleasure. But to be rapt means to be 
taken away from the body. So also ecstasy, we now interpret as meaning uh, in a state of high pleasure. But it means to be outside yourself, to stand outside yourself. Your soul has left you, it is with God. As Arabs say of all crazy people, be kind to them. They're not here, their soul is with God. But actually, if it can be true, as Buddhists say, that nirvana and samsara are one, and if it can be true, as Christians say, that the spirit can be made flesh, the word can be made flesh, then obviously the highest form of man is not sitting in a trance like a lump on a log with a perfectly blank mind. Because if that were the highest state of consciousness, it would be an exclusive state of mind. A state of mind that shuts out life. And in that sense it could not qualify for being what the Hindus call non-dualistic. They always speak of the highest reality as being not one, because one excludes many. Not nothing, because nothing excludes something. Not being, because being excludes non-being, and vice versa. So they use this word non-dual to mean that which doesn't exclude anything, which, as it were, has no outside. As we say, space has no outside. You can only have outsides inside space. You can't have any outsides outside space. There is no outside space, even though space may be curved. Finally. So, yeah, if you want to think incidentally of that uh, curved space, go and take a look at a photograph in um, The Life, a book on mathematics, where there's a picture of a Klein bottle, which is a three-dimensional Merbius strip. The Merbius strip, you know, is a piece of paper that is twisted once and then joined, and it has only one side and only one edge. Now, a Klein bottle is a three-dimensional Mobius strip, and it only has one inside, it has no outside. You can say it has an inside and no outside, or it has an outside and no inside. It's a fabulous little, little trick. But there's something like that would be the nature of space, uh, as that which does indeed tr transcend the opposites. Um, <laughs> not quite, no, we'd have to do one extra move on a circle to make it into a Klein bottle. Uh, you'd have to tuck its head through the ins through the side of its skin and make the aperture through the mouth continuous with the inside of the serpent towards the tail, you see. That's more or less what a Klein bottle is. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm getting to, I'm giving you something out of the general history of religions show that what has been meant by the mystical state, the state of samadhi or awakening in certain traditions, is not this state of trance, but a state of consciousness in which you can perfectly well carry on your daily affairs. And of course, what is meant by a bodhisattva as the ideal type of a Buddhist person is that he is not wrapped that he is actively engaged in the light of the world because he has gone beyond the illusion that nirvana is to be found away from everyday life. So what is then the point of meditation? Why meditate? Why do you have to crawl off into a hole or go to a Zen monastery or uh, retire and be quiet when this is only a withdrawal? Is there anything to be said for it? Well, meditation is in that, in that sense as a practice, as a discipline, is a very curious problem. Because from one point of view it's a help, and from another point of view a hindrance. And I think we have to understand, first of all, that meditation exercises are medicinal rather than dietary. The same could be said of LSD. A 
medicine of a diet. Uh, something that um, is described in Zen as when you want to open the door or summon someone to open the door for you, you pick up a brick and you knock on the door. But you don't carry the brick into the house. When you need a raft for crossing a stream, you cross the stream on the raft, but you leave the raft on the bank at the other side. You don't go carrying it around. But a lot of people, when they get into meditation, or they get into religion, or into um, any kind of exploration of this sort, turn the door into a revolving door, and keep on going round and round and round, and never get through. They say, what a gas it is to be in this revolving door. So maybe a good definition of a parasite is the person who goes through a revolving door on someone else's push. <laughs> So there are all sorts of people in the religious racket who are uh, going through revolving doors. And they're very bitter about people who walk right through and leave the door behind because they say, well, you haven't uh, paid enough respect. But you must really understand religious one-upmanship. It's a tremendously important thing. And don't be caught out by this because what happens is there's a little game going on which I'm going to initiate you and it's played in Zen, which is... It, it works like this. <laughs> if you go to a teacher and ask for spiritual instruction, or even if you come to a seminar like this, you are, by doing that, confusing yourself because you are looking for what you're asking for outside, as if someone else could give it to you, as if you didn't have it. So the teacher knows that as long as you do that, you haven't understood. But he doesn't just tell you to go away. We may sometimes uh, just say, go away, I'm too busy. And in any, in any case, I can't tell you anything. Well, people won't take that for an answer. They won't take no for an answer. And furthermore, if he just said, go away, they would just find some other teacher who would exploit them and uh, maybe keep them as followers for years and acquire a great deal of money by so doing. But what he does is another thing. He tries to give them the put down, as if to say, you have a great long distance to go yet. Your attainment is uh, not at all perfect. And uh, where uh, they, they're always talking about other sects and other schools and saying, well, they haven't really got the point. So that you keep losing faith in yourself and uh, feeling, my goodness, I haven't yet attained this thing. And that keeps you working. But all the time, you're being talked out. It's like someone who's a pickpocket and he's stolen your own watch and is selling it to you. But just so long as you can be talked out of yourself, you deserve to be. <laughs> now, you become a very aware of this if you ever do momentarily slip into some sort of a mystical experience uh, you become aware of this tremendous gamesmanship going on uh, and you see it as sort of continuous with, the, with all sorts of cosmic games that are going on of uh, creatures eating other creatures up and uh, the creatures that get eaten of course transform themselves into the creatures that eat them and then in turn, uh, eat other creatures. And uh, 
that you, you see the whole hide and seek game going on and then you realize very clearly that the state of development that you are in now is uh, no better and no worse than anybody else's state because it's like uh, space again which planet is in or which star is in the best position well it's all equal they're all in the middle any one can be considered as the center one any point on a sphere is the center of the surface of the sphere So, you know, in the same way, everybody, in all his behavior, whatever he's doing, whether we call him from a certain point of view sick, or whether we call him healthy, whether we call him good or bad, neurotic, normal, psychotic, sane, uh, all the manifestations are just like uh, the leaves on the trees. And uh, in each uh, being in a unique way, is, as Christians would say, manifesting the will of God. So, there really, from that point of view, there is nothing to do to attain Buddha. Nothing at all. But you see, that's very difficult to understand, because a lot of people, when they hear that there's nothing to do, try to do nothing. <laughs> and you can't. Because you are karma, and karma means action. You can't do nothing. But uh, the thing you're looking for, or think you're looking for, is what you're doing. Is what's called you. Only of course, as we all know, uh, we've got ourselves into the idea that oneself is so difficult to see. Because it's like, uh, as I've often said, trying to bite your own teeth or look into your own eyes, and you can't find it. It's always behind. It's like your head is, uh, from the optical point of view, a blank space. Neither light nor dark. It's right in the middle of everything. And so, one of the great tricks of gurus is to set people looking for their heads. There's a famous story of a king in India in ancient times called Yajnataka. And one morning he woke up and reached out for his mirror and brought it over. No head. He was looking the wrong side of the mirror. And you know, he was kind of bleary-eyed and had a hangover. So he summoned servants and said, Ye gods, I've lost my head. Find it. And uh, they said, but your majesty, it's there on your shoulders. He said, it is not. I can't see it in the mirror. Nobody can show me my head. So they were rushing all over the place. The head. Now the trick to that is, of course, that uh, you are perfectly well aware of your head. Only not in a form in which you expect to be aware of it. You expect to be aware of your own head in the same way as you're aware of other people's heads. But that wouldn't be true of you, because you've got an inside view on your head. You have an outside view on other people's heads, because of course you're taking an inside point of view. But the way in which you are aware of your head is in terms of what you are seeing and hearing. Because all sights and all sounds are what the nerves inside your head are doing. That's how to be aware of one's head. You are aware, therefore, of yourself, the mysterious self that you have, in terms of experience. Because there isn't really any difference. But that always escapes you, you see. So perpetually, so long as you don't understand that, you can be talked into, going on to all kinds of weird excursions. And just so long as you believe it, you're a sucker. You're hooked. And it takes a tremendous inner confidence and nerve 
finally to say, hey, don't do that stuff. I, I, I see through your game. And uh, because gurus are very clever at putting you down, but they're just trying to see how strong you are. Testing you out. See if they can put with you. So long as they can, you see, they're going to go on doing it. Because they're going to get you to the point where they can't do it to you anymore. Then they'll graduate. And so, uh, one of Rinzai's students, after he saw it, said, Well, there wasn't much in Rinzai's Buddhism after all. Of course there wasn't. He said boldly and straight out, my teaching is just like using an empty fist to deceive a child. You, know, you play games with a child and pretend you've got something here. And the child goes into all kinds of uh, tizzy to get you to open your hand and show what it is, and then there's nothing. Food. So, you, so you, you can be fooled. As long as you can be fooled. <laughs> when you can't be fooled, you don't ask the question anymore. Because it's all become clear. It's all become clear that there is no puzzle about this universe. What makes you think there are puzzles about this universe? Very simple. Right? You're trying to explain it. And when you explain things, what do you, what do you mean by explanation? There are several meanings of explanation. There's really one basic thing. First of all, to be able to translate what is happening into terms of words or numbers. In other words, to describe. But a real explanation is not just a description. It's a description which enables us to control what we're describing. But didn't we see in the last session that to control the world is not really what we want to do? So that if all explanations have as their function, enabling us to control things, then maybe an explanation isn't what we want. And furthermore, you can very simply see that what makes things complicated is explaining. When somebody explains to you how a flower works, and he's a great botanist, and analyzes all the innards of the flower, and shows the channels, the fibers, the processes of reproduction, and uh, so on that go on in it. Everybody stands fascinated. How complicated that is. How clever God must have been to create that flower. To have all that complexity. It isn't complicated at all. It's only complicated when you start thinking about it. Because the vehicle of words is a very clumsy one. And when you try to talk about the processes of nature, what is complicated is not the processes of nature, but trying to put them into words. That's as complicated as trying to drink up the ocean with a pearl. It takes forever. And so this intense complexity that we see in it is created by our attempt to analyze it. And so what we do is, you see, when we analyze, we use our eyes and ears as scouts. We dissect them. And we have to put a label on every piece we chop off. So we scalpelize and we get it right down to atoms. Getting finer and finer and we suddenly thought, well, we've got to the end of it because the word atom means what is not cuttable. Atomos. Uh, but then we found we could cut the atom. And lo and behold, Big please and the police upon their backs to bite. And it goes on forever. There is no end to the minuteness which you can unveil through physical investigation. For the simple reason that the investigation itself is what is chopping things into pieces. And the sharper you can sharpen your knife, the finer you can cut it. And the knife of the intellect is very sharp indeed and the sophisticated instruments that we can now make, well, there's probably no limit. 
But in a way, all that is vain knowledge. In a way. Because you see, it, it, what it does is it gives you the illusion that you've solved the problem. When you have controlled certain things and you have solved certain problems, practical problems, you say, fine, more of that, please. Let's go on solving problems. And then you do. You create a world of people, as we are today, far more comfortable than people who lived in the 19th century. Just remember the troubles of going to a dentist and the children some of you in the children, of uh, medicine, of uh, badly heated homes, of uh, all sorts of things that we don't put up with anymore. But the problem is we keep running into this thing that all constant stimulations of consciousness become unconscious. And when we take it as a matter of course to have certain consciousness, then we switch the level on which we worry. When you solve a whole set of problems, people find new ones to worry about. And after a while, you begin to get that, haven't we been here before, people? Aren't we just going round on a cycle and doing the same old thing over and over and over again because we don't realize that we're chasing our own tails? by an eternally recurrent process of not knowing who you are. That is the hide and seek. That is the nature of what the Hindus call the Manvantara and the Pralaya, the period of the Manvantara in which the worlds are manifested and the period of the Pralaya in which the worlds are withdrawn from manifestation. In and out, in and out. Evermore came out by the same door as in I went. The thing is, to get to the point where you can see that you are doing that in every moment of your existence, with every tiny little atom of your body, you now at this minute are the whole, the whole system of inning and outing. In other words, you often think perhaps, um, maybe a long, long time ahead, I shall reach the point where I wake up from manifestation and overcome the world illusion and discover that I am the supreme reality behind all this diversification. My friend, there is no diversification. In other words, what you call diversification is your game. In the same way as you chop the thing and then you say it was made of pieces. Or you forget that you cut it. So when you see the world is complicated, that there are life problems, and that uh, you, you might one day succeed. See, hundreds and hundreds of people are running like mad after something that they call the, that is success and they have no idea what it is. So in exactly the same way, the guru is keeping you running and running after spiritual attainment. You don't know what you want. This is where Krishnamurti is so tough. Because he says, if you ask me for enlightenment, how can you ask me for enlightenment? If you don't know what it is, how do you know you want it? Is that any concept you have of it will be simply a way of trying to perpetuate the situation you're already in. If you think you know what you're going out for, all you're doing is you're seeking the past. What you already know, what you've already experienced. Therefore, that's not it, is it? Because you say you're looking for something quite new. But what do you mean new? What's your conception of something new? Well, you figure I can only think about it in terms of something old. Something I once had. So he doesn't say anything. He doesn't indicate anything positive. Everybody says, why are you so negative? Why don't you give us something to hang on to? 
Well, the simple answer is it would be spurious. You don't need anything to hang on to. You're it. You don't need a religion. But then you say, well, well, what is all this religious stuff about then? Why don't we just forget it? And try. By all means, just go away. Don't go to gurus. Don't go to church. Don't enter philosophical discussions. Forget it. But then you'll realize that by having consented to forget it, you're still seeking. What a trap. What can you do? You see, if you stay here and listen to me or to anyone else who comes around here, you're fooling yourself. But if you go away, you're fooling yourself too. Because <laughs> you still think that's going to Im improve your situation. And therefore, when you discover that it doesn't, you think, well, maybe it was a mistake to go away, and you come back to the guru. And he looks at you and says, uh, 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 you are very undisciplined, very, uh, very uh, inferior student. And uh, you, you need to apply yourself. Well, as I explained, I explained what he's doing. But it comes down, in a way, to a sort of contest for the guru. Well, will you call his bluff? You're afraid. Because you might discover that if you do call his bluff, he's no better than you are. <laughs> well, that's what you're supposed to find out. But without being cynical about it. He's as divine as you are. But you've got to call the bluff. There's going to be a showdown. And it's, it's a double bind, the whole situation is a double bind. Because it doesn't do any good to stay here, and it doesn't do you any good to go away. <laughs> Either to do something about it, or to do nothing about it. Now then, there's something else. When you understand that, and when you realize that uh, there's nothing to realize, because it's all here. Senor Slowpoke, you will be good with the chili peppers!